I'm Kari Rowe, and you're listening to the Foreign Saints Podcast, reviving the hearts of those who die daily, a show committed to the spiritual and social vision of Jesus Christ, loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving your neighbor as yourself, and making disciples of all nations in your own personal context. We are continuing with our verse-by-verse walk through the Gospel of Matthew. We will be in the first 14 verses of chapter 12. But before we get into it, man, man, today was a today was a really a really good day. Um, shout out to my new friend Gene. If you're listening, man, it was a great great conversation. Um, for those of you that aren't Gene, um, consider this the trailer, I guess, for the next episode of Lessons in the ICU. Had an amazing conversation uh, with a patient at the hospital today. Um, He's a Christian, and he gave a fantastic testimony, and he gave me permission to share a portion of that on the show. But that's just not what this episode is about, but it is fantastic. A fantastic story um, that should, cha- hopefully, that should challenge and encourage us to stay rooted in Jesus. No matter how much you're tugged, no matter how much your leaves are pulled off, stay rooted in the Son of God. Stay rooted in the Father. And I hope it will also encourage us to lay everything that we have at the feet of the Father in sheer obedience and sheer givenness and just ask how can you use me how can i be of service to your kingdom and you will be astounded with what the father gives you to do um <clears throat> additionally um just some fun things in my own life uh my wife and i will be celebrating our four year uh, marriage anniversary um tomorrow when i say tomorrow it's probably the day that this or the day or the day after this episode goes online. So definitely praise God for that. It has been a joy these first four years um, with her and with our two with our two beautiful boys. That has been that journey has just been a blessing and I've grown so much in that. I've grown so much in Jesus. I've grown so much in the faith just in such a short time. Um you know, just, just encouragement, encouragement to all the young men out there. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to, you know, build a family. If that's where God is leading you, there is a joy, there is a maturity, there is a peace in that, that (laughs) that's just not in the world, man. It's just, uh, just not in the world. But speaking of rest, Like I said, we are in Matthew chapter 12, and fair warning, this episode is a lot of theology. It's a lot of theology. There's a lot of practicality as well, Um, but considering where we left off in chapter 11 with Jesus saying that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, right? We unpack the idea that yoke, that a Hebrew teacher's yoke was his teaching, Right, so Jesus is saying that his teaching is for the burdened, it's for the weary, and it gives them rest. It gives rest to the weary soul. And Jesus is saying that his teaching does that, his correct theology does that. And the beginning of Matthew 12 here, the beginning of the next chapter, is a demonstration of how the teaching of Jesus brings rest for the weary. Um, So, any and all, you can probably consider this episode maybe one of the go-to episodes for the Sabbath. We will be talking about it. Um, But for now, let's go ahead and jump into the text. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the text. Um, I'm reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Makes it a lot easier um, for those that are just listening audio only to be able to get the gist of it without feeling like they're fighting the text. But trust me, I do my homework in the Greek and the Hebrew. Um, And, you know, I deviate where I need to. Um, But like I said, let's go ahead and read these first two verses of Matthew chapter 12. 
Oh, but first, um, Father, thank you for just this opportunity. Thank you for an amazing day at the hospital. Um, not just with my newfound, uh, newfound friend in the faith, newfound brother in Christ, uh, Gene, who's been walking with you way longer than I have. Um, thank you for him. Thank you for that amazing conversation. Thank you for the ways beyond just him. Um, you know that your name went forward today in the hospital and i pray that this episode helps um i pray this episode helps uh make clear the person of jesus make clear the person and love of the father um to those with ears to hear so let's go ahead and get into it matthew 12 the first two verses at that time jesus passed through the grain fields on the sabbath his disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. All right, so let's talk about it, right? The setting is a patch of grain fields on a Sabbath day, which is a Saturday. And the Pharisees pick a bone with Jesus over his disciples doing what is not lawful to do on this day, i.e. work. You weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. And their claim is that the disciples just plucking heads of grain counted as work and therefore was a violation of the Sabbath and that's Jesus' fault. Um, and so just a little bit of historical information, because I always pictured, whenever I went through this story, I, I always pictured the disciples plucking really dry grain, you know, like that stereotypical golden brown kind of feather duster looking wheat stalk. Um, but I did some research and I found on GalileeCuisine.com um, in an article called Through the Grain Fields and in a bunch of other articles as well, but this is who I'm quoting. I found this. Quote, but sometime in April, when the heads of the wheat are still green and haven't turned golden and dry yet, the wheat kernels become plump and soft, full of protein and sugar, and this is the only time that they can be eaten raw. Right? It was actually a pretty popular snack during that time of the year. You know, just pluck off some heads of grain. It's plump. It's juicy. It's sweet. It's delicious. It's a, it's a very popular little snack, you know? Um, and so just for me, I don't know if anyone else had that question, but for me, it was a question that I had, right? Why are the disciples plucking heads of grain? That doesn't sound tasty, but I guess during, during the time of year that this would have been happening at, um, they just, they were, they were tastier. They were able to be eaten raw and it apparently tasted pretty good. Um, but notice here that the accusation of the Pharisees even if it was correct, and spoiler alert, it's not, but even if it was correct, that would only be a problem for the 12 disciples. It wouldn't be a problem for Jesus himself. Notice that they're not accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. They're accusing Jesus' followers of breaking the Sabbath. And I can't help but think that to this day, when people can't fault find Jesus himself, when people can't find an issue with Jesus, with God, with the Father, when they can't find an issue with God as revealed in the scriptures, they resort to accusing his followers of sin, which in so many ways, man, misses the point of forgiveness. The truth or falsehood of Christianity doesn't rest primarily on the morality of the followers of those who claim to follow Jesus. It just, it doesn't, not in the way that people think, you know, you have to deal with the man, Jesus. And then after dealing with the man, Jesus, then are you in a position to properly even understand what, uh, you know, who's a hypocrite, who's not a hypocrite, that sort of thing. But we need to have a conversation on what the Sabbath is. And excuse me and in my you know when i'm not making episodes for the podcast i do a lot of work um i do a lot of teaching and stuff on the side um and in some of those conversations lately um i'm going through going through a gospel with a family member praise god for that too but he asked me a question what's the deal with the sabbath and i've had a bunch of people lately ask me this question what is the deal with the sabbath and <clears throat> 
I would usually make an episode answering that question, but considering that we just happen to be in Matthew chapter 12 at the time, this episode will definitely serve as that answer. And you definitely need to understand what the Sabbath is for any of this conversation to make any sense or mean anything to you. So um, with that in mind, we will be going to Deuteronomy. We'll be going to the book of Deuteronomy. Um, let me check my notes to see uh, what chapter here. Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 6. This is where we get, this is the chat, well, one of the chapters where the Ten Commandments are mentioned. And some things to mention here. If you look at verse 6, it reads, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. And then verse 7 says, don't have other gods besides me. That's the first commandment. And then it lists the other nine, right? But notice that the way that they're framed, right? It frames all 10 of those commandments with the truth that God rescued them from slavery. All of the 10 commandments should be thought of in the framework that they're freed from slavery. That's the first thing. Before God gives them any commands, he reminds them that they were freed. That they were freed, right? Because obedience is not the primary thing. It's not the first thing. It's not what comes first in the faith. It's God rescued you. God saved you. And now that God saved you, and keep in mind, the rescue of God was not anything that you did. The Israelites did not save themselves from Egypt. God did all the work to save them. And now that they are saved... Here's how to live. Here's how to live. And the way that God wants them to live will bring them life, will bring them freedom in a way that living under Egypt, living in their old life, never could. Never could. But the command that we're specifically interested in is the Sabbath. So we move down to verse 12 in Deuteronomy 5. And this is what it reads. Be careful to remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or donkey, any of your livestock, or the foreigner who lives within your gates, so that your male and female slaves may rest as you do. Remember, that you were a slave <clears throat> in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So, <clears throat> what we see in verse 12, verse 12 kind of gives a two-part command. One is to remember the Sabbath day, and two is to keep it holy. And much debate and much literature has been written on this subject. If you ask me, the context is what tells us what God means by that. What does God mean by remember the Sabbath day? What does God mean by keep it holy? The context tells us. The context tells us that they are to do all their work within the first six days of the week so that they and all that is theirs, children, slaves, foreigners, even animals, don't have to work either. And then verse 15 bookended it by contrasting the Sabbath rest with Egyptian slavery, never-ending work, right? From all of this, the idea that I get for work, right? Because that's what this hangs on. This, this hangs on what is work? What is work and what is labor? What is really meant by those words? Um, because there has been a lot of adding to that concept of work, right? Such that a lot of rabbinic Jews to this day won't even turn a light switch on during the Sabbath because they would consider that work. They would consider that work. So we need to understand what is work actually is it just doing stuff or is there a specific kind of doing that's in mind here i would say that work in this context is a task or tasks that you do to sustain your daily bread and the way that i come to that conclusion 
Um, like I said, it's partly the context. I don't feel that I really need to go to the Hebrew for this, but I did. I did indeed go to the Hebrew. The word, the English word work, right? That Hebrew word that's translated as work is melaka. And that word labor is abad, <clears throat> right? So melaka work has the idea of occupational work, right? Work that you do for pay, right? It's your occupation. It's what you do to put food on the table. And that word labor abad describes kind of the way that the work is done, right? As a servant, as a slave, right? So this idea of work in the Sabbath is talking about occupational work done as a servant or a slave, which is, I mean, it's just your job. It's, it's your day job, right? Um, so that's clearly what's being talked about here. And we have a parallel passage, um, quite a few parallel passages, actually. But I think the classic one is the passage about the man who is the man in Israel who is put to death for gathering sticks on the Sabbath, for gathering what I presume to be firewood on the Sabbath, right? It's one of those uh, it's one of those passages of scripture that atheists and skeptics and people that just don't like Christianity love to go to to try to prove that Christianity is false or unreasonable or that the Old Testament God is mean and evil or all this that and the third so um <clears throat> but let's go to it right because it's a very foundational passage for understanding what the sabbath is and how this thing is enforced and the the severity of it all um so let me go to the book of numbers numbers 15 verses 32 to 36 and the question that we're asking here is does this passage teach that the sabbath is strict because the sabbath is one of those commands that people think of as strict oh i can't do anything i gotta i gotta cross my t's dot my i's i gotta be on my p's and q's when it comes to the sabbath and numbers 15 is one of those verses that people will go to see the severity and strictness of god for putting a man to death for such a for such a small for such a light action see how strict and severe the sabbath is is that what it's saying? Eh, kind of, kind of. Um, like I said, critics will say that the man was put to death, quote, just for picking up sticks, unquote. Note the how they downplay the action there. And they paint it oftentimes as if the man was put to death for something trivial and or that the man was unaware of the command. Now, I agree that there is a strictness here, but I disagree that it's primarily about the man's actions. I would argue that the strictness is about his heart, right? But let's go ahead and read Numbers 15, 32 to 36 so you know what I'm talking about. This is what it says. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses, Aaron, and the entire community. They placed him in custody because it had not been decided what should be done to him. Then the Lord told Moses, the man is to be put to death. The entire community is to stone him outside the camp. So the entire community brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord had commanded Moses. Right? So yeah, yeah, pretty tough passage, pretty tough passage, pretty extreme passage, some might say. But what's going on here? <clears throat> what's going on here? Always, always, always look at the context, which is one of those things that the skeptics and the haters would never do with a passage like this. Um, backing up in numbers, you don't even have to leave the book, right? Um, our story started at verse 32. We're going to back up and look at numbers 15, same chapter verses 27 to 31 to get some much needed context for this event right <clears throat> now again this is the lord speaking these are the instructions of the lord just before the story about the man picking up sticks and this is what the scripture says if one person sins unintentionally he is to present a year old female goat as a sin offering the priest 
must then make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the person who acts in error, sinning unintentionally. And when he makes atonement for him, he will be forgiven. You are to have the same law for the person who acts in error, whether he is an Israelite or a foreigner who lives among you. But the person who acts defiantly, whether native or foreign resident, blasphemes the Lord. That person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word and broken his command. His guilt remains on him. That passage leads directly into while the Israelites were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. These two passages connect. So this previous context here shows that God gives mercy. He doesn't just give mercy. He codifies mercy into the law, bakes it right into the law to people. And if you read even before that, where we started to read and it said, if one person sins unintentionally, you just have to give one animal sacrifice. Just before that, it says, if a whole community is sinning unintentionally, one animal sacrifice is enough, right? That is a wild amount of mercy. <clears throat> Note that there does still need to be atonement for the unintentional sin, right? People think that if people think that if you know if people sin but they don't realize that it's wrong, that God just sweeps it under the rug. No, not the case. Even unintentional sins require an atoning sacrifice on that person's behalf. But the option was there to make atonement for a person who sins defiantly. In other words, knowingly and intentionally. The literal translation in the Hebrew is with a high hand. For the person who sins with a high hand, there is no possibility to make atonement, right? There's no, and, and that should, that's one of those things that should really, you know, that should really put the fear of God into us. Even those of us that are under, um, that are under the new covenant of Jesus's blood, of Messiah's blood, man, praise God that I get to experience the mercy, the full mercy of God revealed in Jesus. Because as great as, as great as the law was, it was insufficient in that way because humans are much more sinful than just unintentional sins, right? For a person that sins defiantly, for a person that sins knowingly and intentionally, there is no possibility to make atonement. This is why things like premeditated murder, rape, and adultery got the death penalty in the Old Testament, right? unintentional manslaughter was not atoned for by an animal sacrifice either, but there was still a path to a kind of mercy for accidentally killing somebody, but, but intentional rape, premeditated murder, and adultery are by definition purposeful and never unintentional. There's no such thing as accidentally um, raping somebody. You don't accidentally do that. You don't accidentally premeditate a murder. You don't accidentally um, choose to commit adultery. You get caught up in the moment, but it's not unintentional, no. Our man who was sentenced to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath was not put to death because he picked up sticks. That's not why. If you look closely at the text, that's not what it says. It was because the man had sin in his heart, an intentional defiance, a purposeful despising of God's command, but not just his command and authority, but the man also was despising the mercy of God. He despised the mercy of God. He was despising the authority and the mercy of God towards him because, and catch this, the Sabbath was given to this man by God because God's desire for him, God's heart for this man, for this Israelite, was to be free of Egypt's oppression, to be free of Egypt's permanent bondage. But the man so despised God and his authority and his mercy that he willingly, not long after being rescued from Egypt with knowledge of what God saved him from, robs himself of rest. He robs himself of the rest that God had invited him into. 
That's what was happening there. And that's why Numbers places the story there. It just gets done telling you about the mercy given to uh, unintentional sins. The mercy given to communities and to individuals for unintentional sin. And then it describes why intentional sin has, there is no sacrifice for it under the Old Testament system because it was a high-handed sin. You knew what you were doing when you broke this command. And then we get a story of a guy breaking a command in a high-handed way. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. And so it's communicating the severity that, yeah, if you step outside the bounds of mercy in this covenant, there is no mercy to be found for you. But in a way, it's also a picture of, it's also a picture in a way of the gospel, right? Those that don't accept the merciful rescue of God, like you're, you're going to get struck down because you're now, it depends on your work. Now it depends on your work of atonement, your work of rescue, which is insufficient. So the earlier question then, does Numbers teach that the Sabbath is strict? I said kind of, and now with all that context, I'm going to say, but not really. But not really, <clears throat> right? The Pharisees' objection to Jesus in Matthew 12 is assuming a strict Sabbath. But the Pharisees would know all of this Hebrew stuff that we just went through, and they had the first five books, or large portions of the first five books, memorized. So they also were aware of the context clues and numbers that we just went through. They, of all people, should know better than to think that Jesus' disciples casually plucking heads of grain to eat a common snack on a Sabbath is not the same thing as occupational work, as melakah work as an abad, as a servant or slave for one's daily bread. This is a small, mindless task for convenience sake. They took issue with Jesus not emphasizing the added traditions of the rabbis to the same authority as the scripture itself. That was their real, that was their real issue, right? So back to Matthew 12, now that we've got requisite background information for verses 3 and 4. He said to them, Jesus said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the sacred bread, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests? Right? So let's think of that first example. Let's actually consider what Jesus just said. He asked, Haven't you read? So I think we too should read. Jesus brings up the time David and his men were allowed to eat the sacred temple bread, which is very obviously against the law of Moses to do. But the reason was because of their dire need. And Jesus brings up this example to show that in cases of great and dire need, the written law is superseded by a higher law to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Portions of the written law can be over, can be superseded by the law to love your neighbor as yourself. There was a higher virtue to honor in these situations than religious piety, which is interesting, right? Jesus is giving us a framework here of what philosophers would call virtue ethics, right? Instead of this extremely strict, um, absolute morality, um, it's not, but keep in mind, virtue ethics is not the same thing as relativism. Right, The relativism of today says that there is no such thing as right and wrong. Right, That right and wrong is dependent upon you, the subject. Virtue ethics is different. Virtue ethics recognizes that there are objective virtues in this world like love, justice, um, courage, mercy, forgiveness. There are these objective ethics in the world. But virtue ethics, unlike strict absolutism, right, recognizes that depending on the context, um, actually honoring these higher virtues can sometimes be a bit more complicated than we oftentimes like to paint it. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because in our current culture of relativism that wants to completely throw the concept of truth in the trash can, the, 
potential pitfall that we can fall into is in resisting it. As we resist relativism, we lock ourselves in to a more pharisaical, into a more rigid idea of right and wrong. We miss the necessary flexibility that virtue ethics brings to the table. And that's what we're seeing here, right? There was a higher virtue to honor in these situations than religious piety. But one of the critiques that Jesus is kind of giving here to the rabbis, to the Pharisees, is that the traditions of the rabbis are not that flexible. They're not flexible enough to accommodate biblical virtue ethics. There is an actual story. I meant to get the source for this, but um, there is an actual story of rabbinic Jews who let an apartment complex fire rage because they couldn't determine if calling 911 counted as working on the Sabbath. Right? So they actually walked to their local synagogue to ask the rabbi if if calling 911 as the apartment was burning was something that was lawful for them to do according to the law of Moses, according to the Old Testament law, right? That's the sort of inflexibility that happens when you don't have a biblical understanding of, of virtue ethics. But if we actually go and look at this passage, right, 1 Samuel 21, um, as soon as my web browser here loads, uh, 1 Samuel 21, uh, the first four verses here, um, it reads, David went to Ahimelech, the priest at Nob. Ahimelech was afraid to meet David, so he said to him, Why are you alone, and no one is with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king gave me a mission, but he told me, Don't let anyone know anything about the mission I'm sending you on, or what I've ordered you to do. I've stationed my young men at a certain place. Now what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever can be found. The priest told him, There is no ordinary bread on hand. However, there is consecrated bread. But the young men may eat it, only if they have kept themselves from women. Right? So, ignore all that about the mission of the king. You know, David's, David's being coy here, because... The, the king at the time, Saul, was trying to murder him, and David was on the run. Um, David was on the run, and he needed supplies. Now, the bit about not sleeping with women comes from something in Exodus. It's not really relevant to our study here today, but what is relevant is what the priest says in 1 Samuel 21. He literally says, um, there is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. There is consecrated bread, right? So there's something special about this bread. And Jesus said the same thing, right? To learn more about this bread that's mentioned in 1 Samuel, we need to go even further back into the Old Testament, into the book of Leviticus. It's very interesting how as you study the Gospels, it's very difficult to escape Leviticus. Um, Leviticus chapter 24, starting in verse 5. Leviticus chapter 24, starting in verse 5. This is what it reads, verses 5 to 9. Take fine flour and bake it into 12 loaves. Each loaf is to be made with four quarts. Arrange them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. Place pure frankincense near each row so that it may serve as a memorial portion for the bread and a fire offering to the Lord. The bread is to be set out before the Lord every Sabbath day as a perpetual covenant obligation on the part of the Israelites. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in a holy place for it is the holiest portion for him from the fire offerings to the Lord. This is a permanent rule. This is a permanent rule, right? Now, before we get into, um, before we get back into Matthew and Jesus's argument, I want to share some typology concerning this holy bread. And yes, this bread, this loaf of sacred bread is a picture of Jesus. 
is a picture of Jesus, right? There's a reason why Jesus calls himself the bread of heaven. This is one of those reasons. So let's talk about the symbol the symbolism of this bread. There were 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel arranged in two rows of six apiece. This bread was placed on a gold table, on a pure gold table that itself had pure frankincense, right? Had incense by each row, right? And if you've been following the Matthew series from the beginning, you'll remember that in episode two, that gold, frankincense, and myrrh were the three things that were brought to baby Jesus as an offering by the Magi, and we discussed what gold and frankincense symbolized. Gold symbolized, you know, kingship. It symbolized wealth. It symbolizes the purity of the promises of God, right? The Psalms and the Proverbs both talk about the word of God being more, more pure than silver, more pure than gold, of more worth than gold. Frankincense, the incense, represented a lot of spiritual things. It represented deity, the presence of God. It represents prayer. The book of Revelation talks about... Ooh, the book of the Revelation talks about incense as representing the prayers of the saints that are constantly going up before God. And it also represents healing, right? Incense was, uh, you know, kind of had like a healing thing about it. Now this bread, these loaves of bread were, were renewed every Sabbath. Twelve new loaves of bread were made and placed on this table every Sabbath. This bread was eaten by the priests of God, specifically in a holy place, right? Which I take to mean the temple. Um, but what do we know about this bread then? Put this picture together, what does it say? <clears throat> this bread rests on the authority and promises of God, that golden table. This bread is surrounded by symbols of deity and healing and prayer. This bread is not for a dead religion, but for a living one that actually ushers in the healing life of God via relationship and rest as it's made new and eaten every Sabbath by the priests. This bread was not to be eaten by all of Israel, but it was only supposed to be eaten by those who were bound by blood to the temple, the priests. The priests were anointed with blood, right? When they were uh, when they were starting their priestly service, the right big toe, the right thumb, and the right ear were smeared with blood. As a way of saying, as a way of one, atoning for the priest. The priest had sin that needed to be paid for by blood as well, but it bound them to the will of God, right? And you see now how this bread is a picture of Jesus. Jesus, like this bread, rests on the authority and promises of God. Remember Matthew 5, where Jesus said he did not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. He stands on them. He rests on their authority. Jesus is God in the flesh. The same way that this loaf of bread was associated with symbolisms of deity, Jesus is literally God in the flesh who teaches true prayer and brings healing. Jesus said he is not for those who just want a dead religion, but he intends to bring true living religion by ushering in the healing life of God via relationship with God and rest from trying to earn salvation by merit and deeds. His mercy is new and ready every morning. It's new every week. Though the offer goes out to everyone, only those who come into the true temple Jesus and are bound by his blood on the cross are able to partake of Jesus, the bread of heaven. All right. So that's that's the symbolism here, which brings us that this brings us into verses five to eight, where Jesus says this, or haven't you read in the law that on Sabbath days, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent. But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent for the son of man is Lord of the 
Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Right? So, big question here. How are the priests innocent, though they violate the Sabbath? To answer this question, it might help to split it into two smaller questions. Firstly, how do the priests violate Sabbath? And secondly, once we understand what their violation is, how are they still innocent? Well, let's tackle that first question. How do the priests violate the Sabbath? Well, think about it. They are the only Israelites who are doing true Melaka and Abad work. Melaka, occupational, Abad as a servant or slave. The livelihood of the priests came from the temple, right? The Levites, which is the tribe that dealt with the priesthood, the Levites didn't get a land inheritance in the promised land like the other 11 tribes. And God's reasoning for that is because you guys are going to get your living from the temple, right? Um, the context of Leviticus 24 that we just read with that bread tells us that they made it new on the Sabbath day every week. So that is a weekly violation. They're doing work that is connected. They're, they're, they're doing the work of a servant in God's house that functions partly. It's their occupation. Their occupation is priest, and they're doing that servantly work on the Sabbath every Sabbath. Additionally, on top of that, on top of the bread stuff, there were also sacrifices and teaching that occurred on the Sabbath. And if you think about it, in the time of the Pharisees, in Jesus' day, every synagogue violated Sabbath. Every synagogue ruler violated Sabbath by teaching every Sabbath, right? For the one whose job it is to teach every Sabbath, that's your occupation, right? That's your occupation, unless you want to run into something, some weird logic, where by performing your duty on the Sabbath, you're violating the Sabbath. No, no, they're, they're innocent. They're innocent. Um, which, like I said, brings us to our second question, how are they innocent? The Greek word for innocent there is anaitias. Not saying that right at all, I'm sure, but it translates as innocent or guiltless. And I personally prefer the word guiltless. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, but the English Standard Version, I like their handling of this better. He says that though they transgress the Sabbath, they are guiltless. And I like that because the priests aren't innocent by strict definition. They are breaking the letter of the law, but they are guiltless. Not innocent of the deed, but guiltless of the guilt. The breaking of the law by the priests as they perform their proper duties carries no guilt with it because they are in the temple service, right? And then Jesus comes in. So that's Jesus' point. And then he says, as a slam dunk, that something greater than the temple is here. What does it all mean? What does it all mean? Put your thinking caps on, people, because this is this is where the theology gets really gets really fun. This is what it means to love God with all your mind, to dive into the text, to not settle for easy answers, to see the wonder and the intellect of God as He works all these things out. It's pretty fantastic stuff. It's pretty fantastic stuff. And as you see God's brilliance in working things out in Scripture, you can trust that same brilliant mind that planned all this out is also working. In the midst of your life to bring about to bring about his glory and to shape you into an image of the sun it's awesome stuff it's awesome stuff um, but consider this Cons put your thinking caps on and consider this the priests have no guilt associated with their law breaking because they are doing it as a legitimate service of the temple if they don't serve as they do then there is no temple to function this is where the virtue ethics comes back in. They are performing a higher virtue. In other words, I'll say it another way, the special relationship that the priests have to the temple changes their relationship to the Sabbath itself in a way wholly unique from every other Israelite in the nation. For a priest of the temple, breaking the Sabbath means something very different than it does to the typical Israelite because they serve in the temple. 
right? For the priest, for them to not do their work would be breaking the Sabbath. Interesting. Interesting how that works, right? Jesus' claim here is staggering. And it's one that no Jew would ever make unless that Jew actually happened to be God in the flesh. Jesus is claiming here that just like the temple changes the relationship of the priests to the Sabbath in such a way that what would normally be Sabbath breaking is considered obedient, Jesus also fundamentally changes the relationship his Jewish followers have to the Sabbath such that what once was breaking the Sabbath now carries no guilt. It's a typological argument. Just brilliant. Just brilliant. It's part of why we've been focusing so much on typology because Jesus uses it. The book of Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 explains this concept in a little bit more detail. But we're not going to go there. You can go there if you want. We are going to go to Colossians in the New Testament, chapter 2, where Paul, the Pharisee, Paul, the, the repentant Pharisee, explains these, this concept to us very simply. <clears throat> very simply. Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 13 to 17, reads... This is what Paul says. Keep in mind, Paul's a Pharisee, right? Paul is a Pharisee, which means that before Paul came to Jesus, he would have subscribed to all this rabbinic stuff that the Pharisees are spouting in Matthew 12. But after he comes to Jesus, his understanding of these things has been opened. And this is what he says in Colossians 2, starting in verse 13. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them by him. He triumphed over them by him. So that's the theology that Paul gives, right? Basic salvation stuff, but then catch his application in verses 16 and 17. Therefore, because of what Jesus did for you, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Verse 17, these are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is the Messiah. The substance is the Messiah. Paul understood. Paul understood that Jesus fundamentally changes how the Jewish believer relates to the Sabbath and other like regulations. Um, keep in mind, though, that this wouldn't be an issue, and this isn't an issue for a Gentile follower of Jesus. This is not really an issue for a Jewish follower of Jesus, or for a non-Jewish follower of Jesus, because as Deuteronomy stated, remember what Deuteronomy said, the Sabbath was not given to the world, it was given to the nation of Israel specifically. Why? Because God rescued them from slavery in Egypt. That situation doesn't apply to non-Jewish disciples. So this is literally a Jewish issue. This is a Jewish issue that just does not apply um, to Gentiles, but there is a lot that we Gentiles can learn from this, which is why it's good that we look at this. It's why it's good that we look at this, right? And um, hang on a second while I fix my notes here, I'm getting a lot of glitching here. Um, but if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and the Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, you'll see that they both state that God via Jesus' sacrifice, makes each individual believer a priest before God, right? Because we are all priests in service to the one who the temple represents, the relationship to the Sabbath changes for the Jewish follower of Jesus, right? It's not enough that the temple be there. You had to be a priest in the temple to get that special relationship change to the Sabbath, Right? And so, God, in his brilliance, through Jesus, makes us all priests so that all of us have a newfound uh, way of relating to the Sabbath in Messiah. 
as the substance of it. It's absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, right? But if we look at verse, uh, <clears throat> if we look at the next verse there, Jesus says, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Or as the ESV would say, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Absolutely brilliant, right? And so for those that don't know, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice comes from prophet Hosea. It comes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus says if they had understood that principle, they wouldn't have condemned those who are guiltless. Hosea was revealing that God did not intend the sacrifices to culminate in a dead religion, but a living religion. The religion was supposed to be the vehicle for the true and vibrant relationship. It was not supposed to be the container of its corpse, but that's what it had become, and that's what they had made it, right? And then Jesus does something really amazing. He invokes Daniel 7, saying a few things. He says that the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And this is where a lot of work has got to be done. Well, not a lot of work. It's really just one quote. But um, Daniel chapter 7. Let me come all the way down here. The Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 9. This is a vision that Daniel has of heaven. And notice here, the Ancient of Days is the Father. The Ancient of Days is God. So let's read. As I kept watching... Thrones were set in place. This is Daniel's vision of heaven. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's the name of God. One of the names of God. One of the titles of God. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. Right? His throne sits on a wheeled chariot of sorts. His throne was flaming fire, and the wheels of this throne chariot were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was convened, and the books were opened. And the books were opened. I watched then, because of the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. So he goes on to talk about the vision, right? Verse 13, I continued watching in the night visions, and I saw one like a son of man, one like a human, one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. Who is this son of man that not only approaches the Ancient of Days, that only approaches God, but was escorted before him. And more than that, verse 14 says about the Son of Man that he was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Right? What is this? What is this? Jesus says that that figure in Daniel 7 is also the Lord of the Sabbath. But consider this, right? The Lord of the Sabbath would be the one who owns the Sabbath. And the one who owns the Sabbath is God, because God is the one that instituted it back in Deuteronomy. So Jesus is saying that the Daniel 7 figure is divine, is somehow God. That this figure who is equated with God somehow is God. And yet, he is distinct from God, right? The Ancient of Days and the Son of Man figure are two distinct entities. But Jesus is saying, Jesus is tying those identities together, saying, yes, but they're the one God. You see, the multi-personal God, the complex unity of God on display, right? And Jesus is not so subtly claiming to be that son of man. He applies that title son of man to himself all the time. Jesus was always claiming to be that figure in Daniel's, in Daniel's vision in Daniel 7, who, ha who alone has the ability to approach the Ancient of Days as an equal and sit down at his side. 
and have all of creation worship him as such. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. And that's why, that's why I worship Jesus as God, because he is the son of man from Daniel. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. But the other thing that we miss about that is that Jesus telling them that the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath is Jesus's way of saying that the rabbis and the Pharisees and the makers of the traditions are not the ones who have final say over the Sabbath. Right? That's also that's also there in that claim. But Jesus, that he Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Right? That would make him as I said, I'm just reading my notes, that would make him the figure from Daniel's visions and divine, God in the flesh. This is a claim to deity. This is an unmistakable claim to deity. For someone, for a Jew or someone that's familiar with the Torah, you know what he's saying. You know he's claiming to be divine, right? But now we move on to verses 9 to 14, where we see Jesus exercise his authority as the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus shows his Sabbath lordship, right? So let's go ahead and read 9 to 14. Moving on from there, he entered their synagogue. There he saw a man who had a paralyzed hand. And in order to accuse him, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But he said to them, What man among you, if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A man is worth far more than a sheep, so it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. Then he told the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was restored as good as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. They plotted how they were going to destroy Jesus because of this. So let's talk about this, right? Like I said, we see Jesus exercise his lordship of the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath. <clears throat> but what's amazing here is that Jesus goes straight into their synagogue to settle the point, right? <clears throat> Keep in mind... That in the beginning of this whole thing, in Matthew 12, verse 1, it says Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath, he and his disciples, right? So they weren't even necessarily like on the way to that synagogue, necessarily, right? The Pharisees pick a bone with him, they have their conversation, and then because of that conversation, Jesus is like, you know what, we're going to the synagogue. We're going to the synagogue. And there just so happened to be a man with a paralyzed hand there that Jesus could use to prove the point. Come on, man. Come on, man. One of those little things, one of those little things that kind of suggests that Jesus is God, right? <clears throat> he goes straight into their synagogue. He may have been aware that the man was there. He is God after all. The Pharisees, though, with no intention to learn, ask him if it would be lawful to heal on the Sabbath. And I want you to pay attention here. Learn from the Pharisees what a hard-hearted, insincere question sounds like. Consider the following. If they're asking that, right, they're asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The answer to that question has no practical benefit to them. They don't have the ability to heal. So what does a question like that concede? Are they conceding that Jesus has the ability to heal someone if he so desires? Right? The, the answer to this question is only applicable to someone who has the ability to heal. They don't. Are they claiming to say that they know that Jesus can? If so, then he has to be God, right? Because even the prophets of the Tanakh couldn't heal in the way that Jesus did. So why are they even arguing in the first place? You see how blind they would have to be. Or willfully ignorant. To argue like this. Right? Like I said, I think the Pharisees believed in the sense of they intellectually knew Jesus was who he claimed to be. They just hated him for it. They just weren't going to follow him. But I think they were smart enough to see it. And questions like this to me seem a bit too revealing. But notice something about Jesus' final example. The final example that Jesus gives them. What man among you, if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it? And lift it out. That example, 
He started off earlier in the chapter by arguing from Scripture. He argued from 1 Samuel. He argued from, uh, from Leviticus. He argued from Daniel. Right? But they weren't hearing any of that. His final example, his final example, uses the only authority that those guys really cared about. Themselves. Themselves. And we get a staggering piece of information, right? Jesus is God in the flesh, so whatever he says is true by definition. Right? That's why he starts off saying, truly, truly, I say to you, amen, amen, I say to you. Right? <clears throat> and yet, out of the mouth of Jesus, he said, he said that if, they, if their sheep had fallen into a pit on the Sabbath, they would rescue it. They would rescue one of their own sheep on the Sabbath, right? And also keep in mind that with our Hebrew words, malakah, occupational, and abed, abad, slave or servant, right? Rescuing your sheep from a pit is the closest thing to occupational work that's been brought up in this chapter, right? It's certainly closer to occupational work than plucking heads of grain to eat a snack as you walk along and consider the beauty of creation or whatever it was they were doing, right? Absolute hypocrisy, right? Absolute hypocrisy. Now, I'm not saying that it is occupational work. I'm just saying it's a lot closer than the thing, than what they're accusing the, the disciples of, right? But there's a deeper hypocrisy here, the hypocrisy of being willing to make an exception for an animal, but not for a human, the higher being. You see how the virtue ethic comes in again. Um, but then Jesus gives us a brilliant hermeneutic, a brilliant interpretational key to understand this. He says in verse 12, a man is worth far more than a sheep. And here's our hermeneutic. Here's our interpretational lens. So it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. Right? Jesus gives the brilliant lens. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he heals the guy's hand to prove the point. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Watch me, the Lord of the Sabbath, do good to this man. Do like I do. Do likewise. Live likewise. This is why there would be no sin for a Jew to call 911 on the Sabbath. There would be no sin for a Jew even to perform CPR for an hour until an ambulance arrived. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Why? Because it is the higher virtue. Because it's the higher virtue, but also because the Sabbath was made for man. In some ways, the Sabbath was created with this virtue in mind to give people rest, to give people rest and healing and usher them into the presence of God. That's why the Sabbath is there. Don't get in the way of the very thing the Sabbath was built to do. But instead of being humble, instead of being humble and accepting the rest of God, right? They despise him. They reject it. And they plot instead how to kill Jesus, which is a sad statement, a sad picture of many people spiritually. They reject the rest and healing of God and prefer to try to earn their own salvation. That's what they try to do. They are like the man in numbers, right? The man in numbers and the Pharisees have this in common. They despised the authority and the command and the mercy of God. And so instead of just allowing God to rescue them, instead of passively receiving the rescue of God and enjoying the rest of God, enjoying not having to labor all the time, instead of enjoying <clears throat> rest in the presence of God, what does that man in numbers do? Instead, he goes out, he despises the easy burden of God, and he goes out to pick up sticks. And he goes out to pick up sticks. And what are the Pharisees going to do? They're despising God. They are despising the salvation of God. They are despising the rest of God. 
And by the end of this gospel, they too will go out like the man in numbers to pick up sticks. But instead of picking up sticks to make a campfire or something, they are going to be picking up sticks to crucify the Messiah, to kill the very rest of God. Right? And I get it. In our own lives, maybe we're not doing that to that great a degree as them. But to a lesser degree, all of us struggle with this. We, all of us struggle. Um, we refuse to rest and meditate on our life in Christ. We refuse to meditate and to we refuse to rest and meditate on the goodness of God in our lives. And instead we just keep on spinning our wheels until they fall off. Jesus wants to give us rest. And like he said in the previous chapter in the previous episode, his yoke, his teaching is light and not a burden. So learn from him. Learn from him. And I say, let's do that, foreigners. Foreign saints, I say that we do that. I say that we actually sit at the feet of Jesus and enjoy the rest of God. Enjoy the fact that you don't have to go out into the world and do enough good deeds to try to prove to God that you're good enough to enter his presence. And just accept the fact that God wants to place his presence within you by his spirit for free as a free gift. Just repent. Just repent of your sins, right? Ask for that forgiveness and walk in repentance and obedience, right? But not as a way to earn. The obedience is a response to the free gift given. Just like the Ten Commandments only come after God makes the statement of rescue, not before. Not before, right? So, for you know if this uh that's all i got for you this week but if this content has been a blessing to you i would very much appreciate um you know if you're listening on youtube you know like give a comment subscribe um if you're listening on spotify or apple um you know give a star rating um if you're on you know if you're on apple or spotify give leave a review Leave a review of, of the episode in the comments and give it a share. You know, give, give, give this episode a share so that good theology, so that um, clear teaching about who Jesus is and the love of God can go forth into the world and combat the lies and the darkness that are out there, right? And keep, uh, keep a watch on the podcast. New episode of Lessons in the ICU to come soon should be should be amazing. Until then, until then, my family of faith, until then, foreigners, be the hands and feet of Jesus, be the mouth of Jesus. Go in peace.